Well, hey, Element, it is awesome to gather around God's Word again this morning around the topic of uniting and being in unity. And as we close out this series today, uh, I really believe that God's done some serious work in our hearts. And so as we've been reminded through this last month and a half that a divided world needs a unified church. And I'm so proud of you guys. And I just wanted to say well done for continuing to choose unity and continue to choose one another and continue to choose Jesus through a season like this. It's been uh, quite a season, has it not? Um, and I just wanted to say how proud uh, Pastor Erica and I are of you guys and just wanted to say from our hearts to you, thank you for continuing to fight for unity in a season like this. It matters. It makes a difference. And I know that the world is looking on and seeing that you guys are carrying something different. So thank you for that. And we know, as we've talked about for the last seven weeks, that we have an enemy of our soul. His name is Satan. And he wants nothing more than to bring us into division. And so what I'd like to do today, as we put, kind of put a capstone on this series, is I would like to give you some thoughts around why we need to be fighting for this bond of unity. And again, we've been talking about it, but I believe it even goes beyond a season like this, and it goes into our everyday life. And today I want to talk to, to us about that. And so I'd like to open up this morning if you have your Bibles. Hopefully you've got them with you. If not, grab one if you can. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. If you've got your phone, you can pull up a Bible app right on there too. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. And this is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, and this is what he says. He says, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you. So Paul's writing, he says, hey, listen, church, I urge you. And I, I would say the same thing to us this morning. Hey, church, I urge you, okay, to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And then check out verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called the one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all, who is over all and through all and all and all. So Paul's like, look, do whatever you can do. Do the hard work to fight for the Spirit of unity. Keep the bond of peace. And we've been doing that. Um, another scripture that reminds us of this is Psalm 133, one of my favorite Psalms. And it says this, it says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like the precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard. We'll talk about that in a moment. Down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. You say, what does that mean? We'll talk about that in just a moment too. For there, where? There, in the place of unity, the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So how good and pleasant it is when God's people dwell together in unity. There, in that place, God is bestowing his blessing and pouring out his life forevermore. We have this kind of odd analogy of oil coming down Aaron's beard and dew coming down um, on Mount Zion as if um, onto, onto the um, Mount Zion as if it were the dew of Mount Hermon. So we'll talk about this. In, uh, in just a moment, I want to remind us of a running analogy we've been using, and then I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to jump into our points this morning. But um, the running analogy is that we are refs on a football field, and we do not play for either team, and we do not wear the jersey of either team. We are a third team on the field, and we wear a different colored jersey, and we respond to and are under authority of a playbook or a book of authority that comes from a different place. And when we are obedient, faithful, and make our decisions and our calls based on the book of authority, instead of the weight or gravity or yelling of the teams or the team's coaches or the people in the stands on the field, then we are being effective in our calling. And as God's people, we are called to be the third team in our culture. Um, whenever there's that divide, we are called to fight for unity. And so we've been talking about that. And not wearing either team's jersey is not a compromise of the mission, but it is the mission. And again, I want to pray for us this morning. Father, thank you for this morning. God, we pray that even over these next few moments, as you help us look into your word, that we would be ones who would fight for the spirit of, of unity, God, for the bond of peace, and that we would make every effort as Paul charged and challenged us with, and as I feel called to charge and challenge us with this morning, that we would make every effort to keep that bond of peace. And there are great reasons why. And God, would you help illuminate those to us as we look into your word this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Awesome. Well, like I said, it's not just that we need unity in a time of cultural tension. It's that we need unity all the time in our life. 
And I want to give you a couple points today as to why. So four reasons why it's worth making every effort to keep a spirit of unity. Four reasons why we should be making every effort to keep a spirit of unity in our everyday lives. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. We can't really be happy by ourselves. So yeah, we've been talking about cultural tension and how we need to fight for unity, but let's put that aside for today as we close the series. And let's talk about this. You can't be happy by yourself. You say, well, I can be pretty happy by myself. Um, everybody wants to be happy. And we, we kind of have this subtle belief, don't we, that, um, that happiness actually comes um, from creating our personal, our own personal paradise. And for some of us, that may be uh, like on our own, our own personal paradise. And so we all want to be happy, but I think we have a contorted version of what happiness really looks like. And of course, we can have a temporal happiness by creating our own personal paradise. Not that there aren't nice things about creating a bubble around yourself financially or uh, whatever you might want to um, create around yourself, money or comfort or pleasures or seclusion or self-dependence or control or whatever we like to kind of bubble ourselves in with. But really, truly, the Bible says that we really can't be happy, truly happy, if we're on our own. At the very beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, Genesis 2.15, it says, The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden, paradise, to work it and to take care of it. So God creates Adam, puts him in paradise. He has a job. He's working. He's enjoying himself. He's in paradise. And then um, check this out. Genesis 2.18 says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So in verse 15 of Genesis 2, Adam is created by God with God in paradise with a purpose. And then God says, you know, this isn't really a good setup. You need another person. You need a horizontal relationship, not just a vertical relationship and a personal paradise. If you're really going to be happy and it's really going to be good, God says you actually need some horizontal relationships. And so we can be vertically alone apart from God, or we can be vertically vertically connected with God, but we can be vertically connected with God and still be horizontally alone. And God looks on at that even in paradise and says, that's not good. We actually need horizontal relationships in order for us to be happy, for it to be good, at least in God's eyes. And Tim Keller said this, he said, God designed us to need horizontal relationships with other human beings. This is why even in paradise, loneliness is a terrible thing. We should therefore not be surprised to find that it, that all the money, all the comfort, and all the pleasure in this world, are uh, all of our efforts to recreate a paradise for ourselves are unable to fulfill us like love can. And I think he says it so well that love is very fulfilling. But I will tell you something you already know. Love's very fulfilling, but love's also very messy. It's very complicated. And when you look in the book of Genesis, as we've been looking, God creates a horizontal relationship for Adam. Her name is Eve. And God puts them together in the garden. And look at what happens almost immediately is relational brokenness enters in. So God creates them. They're together. They have horizontal relationship. Love horizontally is now in play. It, we have capacity for it. And God said it would be good for us to have that capacity. And yet, as soon as that's created, um, sin enters in, brokenness enters in. They begin pointing fingers at each other. They begin blaming each other. And um, they begin blaming God. And God covers their shame and brings freedom to their failure. But they enter into this horizontal brokenness that we see in relationship. And so the question kind of gets begged is, how is this good, God? And so in God's kingdom, here's what I want you to see. And I have this written down in my notes is that relationship is good even when it's not immediately pleasant. And relationship and capacity for horizontal relationship and love is a good thing in the Bible, but it's also a messy thing in the Bible. And the Bible shows us that those horizontal relationships are going to be broken and fractured, and they're not always going to be perfect. They'll actually never be perfect. And yet God says, if we do not have them, it's not good, that we cannot be satisfied and fulfilled without love, and we cannot be satisfied and fulfilled and happy without one another. And that's why we fight to keep unity. Psalm 133.1, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. So what would happen if our happiness, and we understood that our happiness was not predicated on a physical, personal paradise built around us, but our our happiness was actually coming out of a relational unity that we had with broken people around us. And that, yes, messy, but 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 beautiful relationships horizontally are actually 
the way that we experience joy as human beings. And I believe that it is and that we all need unity in horizontal relationships if we're actually going to be happy. Again, not perfection, but fighting for a spirit of unity in horizontal relationships. So we can't really be happy by ourselves. So that's a first reason why we should contend for a spirit of unity because we can't be happy by ourselves. Number two, if you're taking notes, is that we can't really be productive by ourselves. And of course, we can um, be productive at some level by ourselves, but really think about the exponential power of being with other people and what we can achieve if we actually work and operate together. Um, Now, this is interesting because Psalm 133 talks about how it's as if the dew from one mountain were actually present on another mountain. So uh, Mount Hermon in Psalm 133 is 100 miles northeast of Jerusalem, and it rises at at the the level of the the elevation of about 9,000 feet. So there's continually snow and dew and water that runs down uh, Mount Hermon, and it supplies the surrounding dry areas, the the different uh, valleys and, and mountains. And now in Jerusalem, um, it's especially dry during the summer months, and life uh, from Hermon, the Mount of Hermon, is needful. And so basically what you have is you have Mount Zion that's dry, and there's not a lot of life there, and then you have Mount Hermon where there's dew and there's life, and it's actually giving life out to other areas. And so the Bible says in Psalm 133, in the place of unity, it's as if the dew from Mount Hermon, the place of life, we're actually running down into Mount Zion. So let me say it like this. Everybody listen to me. In the place of unity, there is supernatural productivity in the dry and barren places. I'll, I'll try it another way. There's supernatural fruitfulness that's made possible in the place of unity. So whenever we have unity, there's actually supernatural life and productivity that moves in. It's as if the dew of Hermon were actually flowing down onto Mount Zion. It's like the place in your life and in my life and in your community and in our community and in your school and, you know, in your workplace and in your family and in your horizontal relationships and the places that are dry and barren and it's a grind and it's hard and it just doesn't feel like there's much hope anymore. It's like in that place, there's supernatural supply and productivity when we walk in a spirit of unity. And this is really, really interesting. Now, on a purely practical level, we can look at just the physical capacity of productivity in a place of unity. You look at something like the Industrial Revolution, where people were moving off of individual farms and they were coming into assembly lines and into cities. And um, and we see that there's supernatural productivity that was made possible when each one came and brought their part and contributed what they had to bring to a greater picture. And, you know, it's really interesting that even right now as we're recording this video and I'm here and there's a microphone and a, and a little tablet, there's other people in this studio right now who are doing their part. We've got um, my daughter actually is on Ecamm right now and she is uh, set up the camera and she's, uh, by the way, some of our team has not been able to be here. And so um, my daughter is here. My youngest daughter is running camera right now. And my son is actually on soundboard. So the reason you can hear my voice is because he's got the headset on and he's rocking and rolling a 32 channel Behringer X32 soundboard over there. And then um, my other daughter is making sure that the screens are working. And even though um, we were not able to do all of the scriptures for you guys this morning, um, we're able to make sure that the lighting and the screens and some of these uh, environment things are set up. And so I just wanted to say that even for something like this, and then one of our team is streaming this right now. And so, you know, as we look at all of this picture, every person is bringing something and adding it to a greater whole. And there's a supernatural productivity that's possible, something that I could never do on my own. And so it's really interesting that when we come together in a spirit of unity, there's supernatural productivity that is available to us. And it is like supernatural life, the dew of Hermon flowing into the dry and arid regions of Mount Zion. And so I just even wanted to take a moment and just pause and just say to you who are watching, I know that we've not been together corporately for quite some time. But can I just tell you that so many of you on Team Element, you guys brought your part and you served. And and even now, so many of you are giving. And each and every one of us as a church family, we all have a part to play. And I know that we're in an odd season right now. I know this is a weird time right now. And I know that for a lot of us, we might even feel like 
we're on a shelf or we've been put to the side. Can I just encourage you? Come on, stir yourself up again. Stir your hope up again. We're not done. God's not done. God has a lot for us to do. And we're going to need every single one of you to bring what you have because in a place of unity, there is supernatural productivity. And like an assembly line, Element Church is going to be turning out love and freedom to our community. And we're going to be reaching old people and young people. And we're going to be reaching white people and black people and brown people and yellow people. And we're going to be taking the gospel of Jesus Christ and planting life into a river and watching it flow and change the nations. And we need what you have to bring because in the place of unity, and we contend for unity in the place of unity, there is supernatural productivity. And we really cannot be productive on our own. And that's the second reason why we should fight for unity. Number three is that number three reason to fight for the spirit of unity is that we really can't know God by ourselves. And you go, well, I don't know about that, Pastor Scott. I can know God by myself in my in my living room, in my bedroom. Yes, you can know God to a certain degree on your own. That's very true. But in Psalm 133, it says this. It says, the place of unity, I'm adding that in for clarity, is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. So here's what's interesting. Aaron was a priest. And the priests uh, in the Old Testament represented the place where God and man in the temple met, met together. And so the priests were actually the kind of in-between between God and man. So Aaron represents God's presence, and he, he is a, a steward of God's presence. And so what we see is that in the place of unity, um, God's presence is coming like an oil. And all through the Bible, you see oil as a representation of God's Holy Spirit, of God's presence. And so here's what we see is that in the place of unity, Psalm 133 would tell us, in the place of unity where we contend for a spirit of unity, it's like oil, God's presence, poured down on the head of Aaron, the priest, in the temple. And it runs down his beard and off of his beard onto the collar of his robe. That means that there is a lot of the oil. There's an excess of oil. I want you to see three significant things about this picture out of Psalm 133 about the oil. Number one is that the oil represents the anointing. I already said that. It's the Spirit of God. It's the presence and power of God. So in the place of unity, where we're fighting for unity, God's presence and power is there. It's like the anointing oil poured on the head of Aaron running down his beard. The second significant thing is about the amount of oil. It is a significant amount. It's it's not just that it it um it's you know conditioning his beard. Um, it's actually running down, dripping off of his beard and saturating the collar of his robe. There's an excess. There's tons of it. It's God's presence with us in the spirit of unity, but it's God's presence in abundance, his power in abundance. He's coming you know, with a lot, a significant overflow, liberal pouring down and over. It's an anointing. That's the second thing that you need to see about that oil. And the third thing is that I want to draw our attention to another portion of scripture, which we won't read right now, but it's really interesting because in Exodus 30, the Old Testament actually tells us the exact makeup of the anointing oil that's used by the priests in the temple. And it's really interesting because this is obviously talking about the anointing oil poured down on Aaron's head and running down his beard onto his robe. And so here's what's so cool is in Exodus 30, it tells us what's in the oil. Here's what's in the oil. Ready? Exodus 30, myrrh, cinnamon, fragrant cane, cassia, and olives, olive oil. Five different ingredients that make up the anointing oil. It's the, it's the recipe that God gave for the oil that he's referencing. And here's what I want you to see is that the oil of, that represents God's presence in abundance is actually made up of diversity. Isn't that cool? Like it's not just olive oil, like one, like olives, like one type of thing and go, well, that's the anointing oil. It's like, no, no, no. It's olive oil and it's myrrh and it's cinnamon and it's fragrant cane and it's cassia. And it's all five things functioning together in unity. It's like five different diversities all coming together for one purpose to represent the spirit of God. And so as we look at Psalm 133 and we contend for a spirit of unity, we understand that God's presence comes, his power and his presence comes in an abundance. And that even the oil representing his power and presence in abundance is made up of a diversity operating together in unity. We have this beautiful picture that that's how God works. And that in that place, 
God is coming with his presence. And here's the thing. We cannot know God by ourselves. It's a diversity of all. It's a diversity coming together. And in that place, God's presence shows up. In that place, God's presence and power shows up in abundance. And in that place, God continues to demonstrate what diversity operating in unity looks like. God's anointing flows liberally. I'll say it like this. God's anointing flows liberally where diversity operates for unified purposes. God's anointing flows liberally where diversity operates for unified purposes. And just one other kind of thing on this third point. I guess two more things. This is uh, just really good, and I want to stay here for a minute. Um, I'll give you two more things on this. Number one, uh, I shouldn't say one because we'll get confused for points. A, the, the, the next thing I want to say about point three here is that C.S. Lewis gives us this beautiful picture that I think we can understand exactly what I'm talking about, is that we can't truly know God the way that God wants to know us without walking in a spirit of unity with one another. And here's why. And, and C.S. Lewis is illustrating this point for us. And he actually talks about how he had two friends, uh, Charles and, and, um, and Ronald. And he talked about how the three of them would hang out together. And then um, one of his friends dies and Charles passes away. And what he talks about, and, and I'm paraphrasing this for us, and I'll read the quote in a second. But he says that as, as Charles passed away, there were certain parts of Ronald that C.S. Lewis lost. And you would think, well, that'd be weird because when Charles passes away, C.S. Lewis would actually have more time with Ronald. And C.S. Lewis says, well, that's true. But there were parts of Ronald that I only got to see because of who Charles was. And when Charles passed away, that part of Ronald that Charles drew out is something I'll never get to see again as his friend. Check this out. C.S. Lewis says, in each of my friends, there's something that only some other friend can fully bring out. Now that Charles has passed away, I shall never again see Ronald's reaction to a specific Charles joke. Far from having more of Ronald having him to myself, now that Charles has passed away, I have less of Ronald. We possess each friend not less, but more as the number of those with whom we share him increases. For every soul seeing him in her own way communicates that unique vision to all the rest. He's saying, look, Charles would tell a specific joke that only Charles could tell in a way that only Charles could tell it. And Ronald would respond to Charles in a way that only Ronald could respond to that kind of joke. And C.S. Lewis is like, and I got to see Ronald in a different way because of who Charles was. And then he, he, he continues and C.S. Lewis says that that he just illustrated, says an old author, is why the seraphim in Israel's vision are crying, holy, 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 to one another. Because they get to see shades of God through what the other one is worshiping in God that they would have never seen on their own accord. And then C.S. Lewis completes, he says, the more we thus share the heavenly bread between us, the more we shall all have. And there's a very real way in which me watching you relate with God actually strengthens and increases and diversifies my understanding of God for myself. And the more diverse we are as a Christian family, the more we get to learn about God. The, the more we're different in diversity, but unified under the banner of Jesus, the more we get to see God in all of his shades and facets. And I get to learn about God by watching you worship him. And you get to learn about God by watching me worship him. And we get to come together as people from different economic backgrounds. And we get to sit at the same table and say, how do you understand God? And we get to learn about God, our father, through the perspective perspective of one another. And I will say that we need to fight for the bond of the spirit because we cannot truly understand God the way we need to on our own. I'll give you this last um, little example here of point three, and it comes from the Old Testament with Eli and Samuel. And Eli is an old prophet and Samuel's a, a young man who's um, who's learning to be a prophet in the temple. And one night they're both sleeping and Samuel hears a voice and he thinks it's Eli talking to him. So Samuel gets up and goes to Eli and says, did you call me? And the older Eli says, no, son, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. This happens three times. On the third time when Samuel hears a voice and gets up and goes to Eli and says, did you call me? And Eli says, I didn't call you. Go to bed. Eli has a revelation that it's God speaking to Samuel. And Eli says to Samuel, Go back, and if you hear the voice again, say this, speak, God, your servant is listening. And so Eli goes back, and sure enough, or Samuel goes back, and sure enough, hears the voice again, and begins to converse as a prophet with God himself. And here's what I think is so interesting, is that Samuel, as a prophet, heard the audible voice of God. I've never heard the audible voice of God. Um, 
Samuel heard the audible voice of God and did not know it was God until Eli, someone more seasoned and more mature in the faith, was able to help him know it was God's voice. And I'm here to tell you that you cannot know God the way you need to know God on your own. And even Samuel, who heard the audible voice of God, needed Eli to help him to, it, it, uh, interpret what was happening in that moment. And so we cannot fully know Jesus by ourselves. We need each other even when God is audibly speaking. And so we can't know God alone, and that's why we need to fight for the, the unity of the Spirit. Number four, and I'll close with this is that um, why do we need to fight for the bond of, of, of the Spirit? Why do we need to fight for unity? Why, didn't, why do we need to fight for the bond of peace? Because number four, the world will never truly know Jesus without unity. The world will never truly know Jesus without unity. And I've talked about this for the last seven weeks, but really unity is way more than us just getting along. Unity is about the world looking on and seeing something in us that's supernatural, that as diverse as we would be, that we would come together under one purpose and that the world would look on and go, hmm, the way they love one another with that kind of diversity, but that kind of unity, there's got to be something supernatural there. Maybe there is a God. And, and I'm not making that up. It's actually the thing that Jesus prayed for you and I before he went to the cross. In John 17, 20 through 21 and verse 23, I'll read this for us. My prayer, Jesus said, is not for my disciples alone. I pray also for all of those who will believe in me through the disciples, their message. So he's praying for his disciples. And he says, but I'm not just praying for my, my disciples. I'm praying for all those who will hear the message and believe through them. That's you and I. He says in verse 21, that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe. Did you hear that? that you have sent me. Verse 22, I have given them the glory you've given me that they may be one as we are one. And then check out verse 23. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. And then check out the next line. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even father as you have loved me. And so guys, as we close up this series unite. Yeah, we need to unite in a time of cultural turmoil like the one we've been in, but we need to unite every single day of our lives. And why do we need to unite? So that we can experience joy and happiness because it isn't about creating a personal paradise around us. It's about actually wading into the mess of horizontal relationships and learning to love one another with the love, grace, and truth of Jesus Christ. And that's where true happiness comes from. So we need that. And then we need to learn to be productive because we can't be productive alone. We can be supernaturally productive in the place of unity. It's like the dew from Mount Hermon, the place of life, going into the place of dry barrenness in Mount Zion and bringing life and productivity there and, and fruitfulness there. And then also so that we can actually know God in a fuller way because I learn about God by watching you worship God. And the more diverse we are, the greater view we get of God, our Heavenly Father. And then lastly, we fight for unity so that the world can come to know Jesus. Guys, we've got to be the third team on the field. And not wearing either team's jersey is not a compromise of the mission. It is the mission. And we must continue to choose to fight for one another instead of fighting each other. And I'll close with this last thought, and it's a challenge is that we can never have unity without intentional decision. It is going to require intentional decision from us as a church family. And we are going to need to pause and we're going to need to stop and we're going to need to ask God and we're going to need to go back and seek the Holy Spirit and figure out, hey God, what do I need to do? What next step do I need to take to pursue unity at Element church. And for some of us, that's for maybe forgiving an offense. For some of us, that's maybe having grace in a season like this. For some of us, it's, it's continuing to make a commitment and a covenant to a church family that you can't even see right now. 
For some of us, it's just continuing to say, yes, I need to lean in instead of lean out of relationship. For some of us, it's making a phone call and apologizing to someone that we've really upset during this last season. For some of us, it's pursuing a relationship outside of your relational comfort zone. I don't know what it is for you, and I believe that the Holy Spirit will speak to you, but I would just say this. We'll never have a spirit of unity in this church or in our city or in our community without intentional a decision without focusing on that decision. And so I want to leave us with that. Practically at Element, there's several ways we can do that. We can continue to lean into groups together. We can continue to choose to serve, serve your church, serve your church, serve your church family. And you go, I don't know how to do that. You know what? Send me an email. If you're, if, you, if you're like, hey, I really want to serve right now and I really don't know how to serve right now, we got plenty of work to do, I promise you. We are as busy as we have ever been. So if you want to serve right now and you're like, hey, I know it's a wonky season and well, we got a Zoom call or something or you know, I got to get on a team that where we communicate virtually or whatever, cool. If you want to serve right now and you're not serving and you want to be part of the Element Family Serve Teams, you can email me. Um, just, just shoot me an email. It's my first name, Scott. S-C-O-T-T at TheElement.Church. Send me an email, man. We'll get it hooked up. And let's continue to make intentional decisions to be in relationship, to serve and to give financially. And then, guys, to love one another, to continue to extend out and love one another. So let me pray for us this morning as we close and as we seek to move into to worship this morning. I'm going to just uh, pray through a couple different threads. Would you just close your eyes, uh, kind of open your hearts. If you feel comfortable, open your hands. I'm going to pray over us this morning. God, right now, God, I pray for happiness and unity. God, I pray for families. I pray, God, for families that are hurting. I pray for families that are thriving. God, I just pray for a spirit of unity in our families. God, I pray that that uh, that our that element marriages will be the strongest marriages. God, I pray that um, moms and dads will... Um, their hearts will be turned again to their kids and their kids' hearts will be turned back to the mom and dad. I pray for intimacy and just um, connectivity. And God, I pray for supernatural relationships in the Element family. God, with our families, with our marriages, with our, our kids, and then God, with our, our church family. God, I just pray that you would supernaturally be knitting our hearts together. God, that you would help us birth new relationships and you would help us strengthen strengthen ones that we already have. And God, I pray for the Element family that we would continue to make an intentional commitment to one another as a church family. God, as we move forward in the church and as our culture gets more challenging and maybe even more, um, God, I don't know what the exact right word is at the moment. It's not coming to me, but even just as the culture and the church might even be more at odds, God, I pray that our church, that we would unify together and we would covenant with one another, that we'd fight to stay connected and committed to each other. And I pray that over us supernaturally, God. And God, I pray for a supernatural productivity in unity. God, I pray that you would help us as a church, God, move and flow with your anointing, God, and that we would be able to reach our city for the purpose of you, Jesus, and we would be able to serve people well and love people well. And as we talked about, it would be like an assembly line of love and hope and faith and, and God, that people would just, they would hear about you, Jesus, that you would just be the big deal in our city. And I pray that this church would be supernaturally productive, God, that you'd be calling laborers in from the north, the south, the east, and the west, and that we would all be bringing our gifts together to contribute and to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. God, I pray we'd lay down our own personal agendas and our own personal re rewards. And God, I pray that we would pick up the banner of you, Jesus, and we would move forward and we would be supernaturally productive in a place of diverse diversity coming together in unity. God, I quickly pray for the churches in our city, and there's so many, but I just pray for several of us by name, God. I pray for URC. God, I pray for the People's Church and the Methodist churches, the Lutheran churches. Pray for River Terrace, God. Pray for St. John's Catholic Church and Trinity Church and Riverview Church and Mount Hope Church and City Life Church and Spirit of Christ Church and God, all the other churches that are carrying the gospel. And God, we lift up the campus ministries to you that are operating in such an odd time right now. But God, we pray for crew and we pray for Salt Company and God, we pray for navigators in his house and all the church uh, ministries on campus that would be carrying the gospel. God, we pray for strategic alliances and we pray that you would strengthen leaders and strengthen lay leaders. And God, we pray that you would show us how to be a part of your kingdom and how to be part of something bigger than ourselves. God, I pray thirdly, God, for um, your power and presence in us and God, that we would continue to know you more in the place of unity. 
God, that you would teach us about who you are, that you would reveal parts of yourself that we've never seen before. God, that you would take us into greater depth and greater life and greater anointing in who you are. And Jesus, that there would be a spirit of adoption over us as a family, that sons and daughters would come running home and come running harder after you. And God, that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in order that we might know you more and that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened and that we would see the hope to which you've called us, the inheritance of your glorious people, God, that you've given us one another. And I pray that God, through being together in a spirit of unity, we would learn more about you. And then God, lastly, I pray, God, that we would just make intentional decisions to create unity, that you would give us courage to make selfless decisions and intentional decisions. You would give us, God, um, the ability to jump into serving one another well. And God, you would weave our hearts together through groups. And God, you would help us engage the, the patterns and the processes of the local church. And God, you would help knit us together, even in our giving, God, financially, that we would trust you with our giving in a fresh way. God, even as we look for a church home. And so, God, we just thank you for all that. And we thank you that as we do that, God, that the world will come to know who you are, Jesus. And we proclaim that over our church, that this is a Jesus church, a church where people will come to know Jesus. And even this morning, if you're listening to the sound of my voice and you've never started a relationship with Jesus and you want to do that this morning, just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I accept your invitation into resurrection life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I no longer want to be my own savior. I surrender my life to you. And I thank you for a new beginning and a fresh start in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. If you prayed that with us, if you would, uh, before you're done, before you go to sleep tonight, if you would text the keyword element to 97,000, same thing that we asked uh, those of you who are kind of with us for a first time or are new around here, would you do that? And you'll get a little link to your phone. Click it on that form. We call it a next steps form. There's a box that says, I started a relationship with Jesus. Check that so that we can get in touch with you and make sure that you have everything that you need to get started out on the right foot. If you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'd love to get you a Bible. We want to do whatever we can do to help you get off and start a great relationship with Jesus. And as we talked about today, you're going to need a family and we invite you to be a part of this one. And guys, just as we um, close down the teaching portion of our time together today, I want to invite us into worship. And as we worship today, I just want you to open your heart and ask the Holy Spirit, hey, what do I need to hear from the teaching today? What one thing would you impress on my heart? Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? And, what, and then the second thing, and what do I need to do this week because of it? And so for some of us, that's going to be making a phone call to somebody. For some of us, it's going to be initiating a new relationship. For some, it's going to be circling back to an old relationship. For some of us, it's going to be recommitting yourself to the relationship of the local church. Um, even if you can't see it the way that you think you, you want to right now. For some of us, it's going to be trusting God with our finances for a first time. I don't know what it is for you, but I just pray that you'll be listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit as we worship. And let me pray this over us as we enter into a place of worship. Father, we pray for this morning as we enter into worship, would you come Holy Spirit into living rooms, into dorm rooms, into cars, into living rooms. And would you just speak, God, to your people. God, as, as Samuel said, speak. Your servant is listening. And we open our hearts like that to you this morning. We turn our gaze to you and we bring all of who we are, lay it down before you and we worship you, Jesus, today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. All right, you guys, let's worship. <laughs> 